Hi and welcome to another um, episode of NLP Upskiller Life. Um, it's a podcast we started recently. We have different guests on. We talk around them um, how we can use NLP to upskill our life and um, make things improve things with your life. So today I'm delighted. Uh, to, we're delighted to be joined by a, a professional snooker player, Fergal O'Brien. Um, he, he's he's uh, very kindly um, agreed to come on the podcast today. So thanks a lot, Fergal, for coming on. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Great stuff. So um, you've been on my podcast, the other podcast before, um, where we yeah. talked about your game and all that kind of stuff. So um, how are you getting on in the game yourself? How's things going with you? Well, since I was talking to you last, uh, I, I think I fell off the tour and then uh, I decided to go back to Q School uh, and I managed to get through that. So as a result of that, I'm back on the tour for at least well, a two guarantee for two years. So um, I wasn't 100% sure about going back to play. I was maybe going to leave it, but mm. I kind of decided just to, to give it a go and uh, I managed to get through. So um, as I said, I'm back on for two more years. Great stuff. And um, what does that mean exactly? Like you're, you'll be back like playing for um, the, the Crucible and all the, the major tournaments, is it? Yeah, well, obviously it depends on my, where, where my rank is obviously quite low. Uh, so I'd have to qualify for those those terms. So the like as it stands today, I'd have to win four matches to qualify for the Crucible. Uh, and then, but then some of the other tournaments kind of start from round one. So like all 128 players start from round one. And then maybe some of the overseas tournaments, I might have to win a match or two to qualify to go mm-hmm. there. But as it sounds like I'm in uh, every tournament. Uh, so one of the tournaments I missed because I was away and there's already been other, two other tournaments, but I didn't do so well in those. So. Mm-hmm. Well, no, not, not a very best of luck with it. Like I hope it goes great. And um, yeah, so like it's it's great to have you on. We we really want to just uh, talk to you a bit around um your game and how how you use like as you did mention on my podcast before you you work with a, a sports psychology psychologist before. Um, yeah. how did you find that yourself, Fergal? Did you find that a big help? Yeah, very very good. Um, I kind of worked with say like a few different people, even uh uh like the coach I'm working with at the moment, Chris Henry. Obviously, he's this technical side, but he's also big into we say the mental and emotion emotional side and it's through him a lot, done a lot of we say like to you know the, the importance of visualization affirmation self-talk breathing uh self-image all those kind of things but even there was a guy as early as 2001 uh i suppose he was called like a life coach or a mind coach sean mm-hmm. farrell was his name from uh like in dublin as well so he was the first one i kind of got in yeah deep we'd say with somebody who was we'd say an expert in that obviously as you're coming through as a junior and amateur um, you're always getting advice and from yeah. people in the club and there would be obviously some pearls and wisdom you know that would be, be passed on but generally when you're coming through even with regard to coaching you really tend to go coaching from whoever's the best player in the club yeah. as opposed to a, a coach and even when I started in the late started playing 80s so like even what was one of the top amateurs coach. If somebody had a coach, uh, they were nearly laughed upon. You know what I mean? As in, like you know, you know, if somebody got beaten, they'd be like, "Oh, yeah, come on back to your coach there." You know what I mean? You, you're really a figure, of, you're really a figure of fun because you've a coach. Whereas mm-hmm. at the same time, if somebody at the, of the same standard was in a golf club and had a coach or getting lessons, he probably would have been feared. So there was mm-hmm. definitely that kind of attitude, and that's obviously coaching's become we'd say allowed or the norm or now essential, but also uh, following on from that then, uh, you know, to work with like mental coach, whether it be sports psychology specific or uh, just, you know, snooker sports psychology or general sports psychology, that has become more or less the, the norm. And you'd certainly be recommending it to a player who's starting off looking at the whole, the whole, whole program, you know, you'd be looking at not just maybe again, which were, laughable back in the day you know the skull and beers and smoking but the you know diet fitness a technical coach and then also a mind coach to have that full team of support uh, around you apart from obviously all your your friends and family and you mightn't be qualified psychologists but obviously the fact that they know you so well yeah. they can, it's often them that can say the right thing at the right time mm. knowing you uh, personally what was in that that's really interesting in the first place I just watched it on TV as a kid. Uh, obviously, 
born in 72. So, you know, by 1980 or so, when it, it, the boom really started, obviously eight or so. And then Alex Higgins won the world championships in 1982. Uh, that, had, that had a massive impact. I remember going up to a room and doing a big Alex Higgins world champion poster and all. And then I'd say certainly from us 14, I wanted to be a professional snooker player. Uh, had to stay in school till I was 18 and obviously do me leaving and all that. But uh, that obviously didn't do me any harm and gave me some somewhat of maturity. Um, and then 19, I, I, I moved to England. So but look, from an early age, you know, I was really interested. I, 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 like most kids, 8, 9, 10, I was also playing football. Um, but about the age of 13, I knocked the football on the head because it was, it was too cold. <laughs> it was too cold. And I didn't like being tackled from behind by some fella twice twice the height to me. Uh, so that wasn't appealing. And, uh, snooker was on my own. I, you know, I, well, firstly, I had, nobody, I had nobody shouting at me to track back or get stuck in. But also, the winning and losing was in my hands. I wasn't, wouldn't have to rely on, on others. Very good. Very good. Uh, before we started recording, uh, you were asking us a bit about NLP, and uh, I was explaining how uh, NLP is based on modelling excellence. And uh, I was just going to make the point there that uh, one of the things that we do by having guests on is to find people who are excellent in their field and to show others um, why they're kind of a cut above the rest, you know, uh, like, for example, in a previous podcast, uh, you mentioned that there were, when you were growing up, when you were uh, an amateur, I suppose, as an amateur status, that there was a lot of amateurs who were more natural, better naturally uh, super players than you were. And yeah. yes, you're Ireland's number one now. And yeah. uh, where are they? Probably still playing in the back room of the pub, like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. So, Did you want me to answer or wait till the interview? Yeah, no, we're, we're in the interview now. Oh, God, sorry, 100%. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, no, that was, I said at the time, obviously, I, I, I had a level of talent. Obviously, you know, um, there was some level of, of talent uh, regarding to snooker, snooker there. But there was definitely others, 14, 15, 16, who... 17 even who were better better than me and even when we were played for the classic snooker club in Binglis which is actually one of the few clubs still open and um, the two of the lads on the team were like the two finalists for the under 16 All-Irelands uh, so like I was the third best player on the club team in the you know classic let alone the whole of Dublin or Ireland um, and then even when I suppose started the amateurs started doing well going up the rankings. I remember like a particular, I actually heard people say, I heard them say it, and then even through other people, that Fergal O'Brien won't make it. And whatever chance X, Y, and Z has, Fergal won't make it. And, you know, that definitely had an impact on me in a positive sense. There was a, there was a drive and a hunger there. Um, so basically, a short answer that was, I basically just outworked them. So those people that were better at me at 14, 15, 16, 17, when we got to 20, 21, I was better, or in some cases, a lot better. Because apart from, obviously as well, when you're 15, 16, obviously it's less, it's, it's less distraction. It's obviously, uh, it's always a tricky age for, well, certainly snooker players when you started in 17, 18, 19, the, and the appeal of um, uh, going out and, you know, girlfriends can, can be more appealing than, you know, st staying in and practicing, you know, uh, for six, eight hours. But, uh, so maybe that would end up being a bit of a distraction for them. That kind of pulled them away from snooker. But I was very, that didn't, I was very clear in my focus. So I was going to bed early, you know, going to bed early to get up early to practice, you know, as much as much as I can. Didn't, uh, didn't drink, you know, wasn't going out. So apart from the actual hours I was putting in, five, six, seven, eight hours on my own, I was, that was also being complimented, we'd say, by, you know, living a good, clean uh, lifestyle as such. That's great. Thank you very much. What do you reckon for a goal is the difference between a very good snooker player to the absolute best? When you say very good, do you mean like an amateur player, the best player in your club? No, in the professional wise, because obviously their limit's going to be very close. But what yeah. makes somebody so like a Stephen Hendry compared to? 
Yeah, because again, if you if you take the 128 players on the tour, um, there's more or less nearly, I'd say, 99% of the shots we could, you know, everybody can play the same level. Okay, there's likes of Ronnie O'Sullivan playing a few shots left-handed, and Judd Trump is amazing cue power. But generally, our skill levels are the same. And then obviously comes into uh, first probably the amount of work you're putting in. So again, if you've players as a general rule, like all sports, whoever was the best was was generally the best prepared and had put the most work in. So again, if you're if the top players are playing six hours a day and you're behind them and only playing four hours, well, if anything, the gap is just going to get bigger and bigger. But then, but then having said that, if you would every snooker player and they all played six hours a day, we wouldn't all be tied like joint number one. You still would have a you know the best. Yeah, so that obviously would then lead to the, the, ment- the mental side. So it's probably that hunger and desire. But obviously, um, under pressure, um, I'd probably say maybe that the practice form and their mentality and being relaxed and practice, they're, they're more, they carry through to their matches under the intense pressure uh, more often or more consistently or produce their best. So I would say my best is as good as their best, but if I would say if I produce my best three times out of ten, the very top probably produced six, seven, eight. So as a result, they're winning eight out of ten maybe matches and maybe win one of the other two and they're not the best. Whereas I'm probably only winning three and the other seven is maybe up for grabs. So if you take that over, they're winning eight or nine matches, I'm winning four, five, six. If you take that over a season or a career, you know, so it's just having that uh, that that uh, that that, co- that consistency. And I said uh like I practiced with Stephen Hendry a lot when he was in the early nineties, when he was, you know, by far the top player, he was like the king. And in practice and tournaments under intense pressure in the crucible on the BBC, there was no change. You wouldn't know his timing, tempo, attitude, everything was the same. Didn't overplay shots or whatever. Whereas I tell myself there's been times where I have, you know, uh, the importance of the situation has basically, uh, Affected, affected, affected my thinking and the process. You know, and as, as Steve Davis actually said a very good quote: "To be able to play as if it means nothing when it means everything." And I would say, from my own experience, to be there's too many times where I played as if it mean, uh, played as if it meant everything, and it did mean everything. And there was just that little bit of um, tightness, trying to control, uh, was very much mentally result orientated. Uh, that's kind of we say. Maybe I suppose you say trip myself up even more than what my opponent was actually doing. So whereas the top players have that men- mentality, so as where as practice our match, they're going to stick to their routine and do the things. And if they lose, they lose. But over the the, the distance of the match, the tournament, the season, you know they're doing the the correct things more consistently. That's excellent, Gregor. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of sense. Yeah, actually. Uh, I was going to ask you uh, about your own mentality. Uh, for example, you do have players who, when they're under pressure and things don't go right for them, they maybe lose the head a little bit. You know what I mean? They uh, and I'm sure you've seen it uh, at amateur level. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Where, but say a professional, even at the top level, right? You do have players and things don't go right for them, and they just lose their head. The head, maybe the head drops, or maybe they lose their temper or something like that. You seem to always have a a a, a very even keel uh, mentally. Uh, is that always the case? And is there something that you do to to help you? You know, something in your daily processes that uh, helps you that that way. Yeah, well, I'd say, I'd say naturally, it probably would be it would be a sense calmer than most. And again, it was probably when you're starting off, maybe being trained by as said pe- people that maybe apart from maybe maybe my dad or something, but also you know people in the club being being, being told you know. You never. That was a, like a very early at all. You never show any emotion because you're giving your opponent. It's a sign of weakness, and you're giving your opponent's lip. So that was probably drilled into me. They were probably suited me maybe more than others. So I, you know, look. Of course, I've, I've lost. And remember once as a kid uh, playing, uh, just practicing with somebody, and uh, a Mister ever. And I picked up the chalk and I threw it across the room in the club I was playing in Capel Street. And we walked over, got me chalk. And when I came back, the fellow was playing. He was just like a good club player. He said, never do that again. And to be fair, he was, he was 100% right. It was the exact exact thing to be told. I was probably maybe 15 at the time. So, 
you know, obviously it was, it wasn't perfect. And more often than not, my temper would have been good. But if there's a time where a bad habit could have crept in, I was fortunate that somebody put me right on it. Um, so then it would be sort of like skills dur during a match then when I'm, when I'm playing that um, one thing I learned, I think reading a book from Cliff Thorburn used to do it, I, I still do it. If I'm back in my chair, because uh, when you play your very best, if you ask me what I'm thinking, I, I nearly wouldn't be able to tell you. And then there'd be other days, the very next day, and you could have a million thoughts in your mind is racing. Now, some of them could be positive thoughts, but you're still no longer in the present. You're getting way ahead of yourself. Um, so if I've kind of lost that as a, as a, a little uh, drill I do is when I'm in my chair, I pick up, might pick up just a, 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 a dot or whatever on the piece of the carpet, and I'll stare at that and count. I might take 20, 50, maybe even up to a 200. So that would effectively, if I'd say my mind was full with nonsense, by doing that, I've effectively emptied my mind again. And now that my mind is emptied, I can now refocus and hopefully remind myself with the thoughts. The couple of little keys I would have liked to, before the match, I'd ideally like to say, right, okay, well, keep to my routine or try and play one shot at a time or play positive mm -hmm. shots. Those kind of would be my little keys. And again, some days if you nail them. I mean, generally when I nail them, I played very well and won. And then the other days, even though you might have the formula and the recipe, like as in do X, Y, and Z, when you get out to play, for whatever reason, the nerves, concentration, whatever, you know, you, you don't do it and you're just distracted. Um, and then another thing I also tried to do is actually again, learn from reading about Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. He played a bad shot. He had a 10-second rule. So he picked like a line. So he gave himself 10 seconds on, then he picked a little imaginary line. And once he stepped over mm -hmm. that, that was the end of the shot. So... Again, on, on a good day when I'm focused and prepared, even if I've lost a bad frame or missed a shot, I've lost a bad frame before I come to break, I will pick a imaginary line on the carpet and consciously, once my foot hits that ground, then I go, right, that's that's like a key to like that, that frame is gone. So then you're, because then you don't want to lose the frame you're currently playing because you lost the last frame or whatever, you know, and losing one bad frame now becomes two or three or four. And, you know, so now that's the theory. And I've managed to do it, but I mean, there's been plenty of times, despite what I'm saying, despite my knowledge, I haven't took my own advice. And it says the occasion temperament has overtook, but there are certainly skills that have stood me in good stead. And certainly for the next two years, I'd like to, I'd like to be doing them for the, the next two years. Yeah, that's excellent. Do you know the difference between a good shot and a bad shot when something's gone really well for yourself and you've gone, hmm. Can you, is there a sensation within body or is there any thought or anything like that? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, God, you play, you play a beautiful shot. Still now, you could maybe mention essentially you could have played 30 years ago and, like, you know, you'd be smiling. Just get, literally get, you know, a, a, a rush up. But just like you would have any really, really good memory. Oh, you could totally, you know, you could totally feel that and remember. It's a beautiful, absolutely beautiful feeling. I suppose at any level of sport, you know, when you hit that one great drive or, you made a basket or you had a good serve or you returned a winner against somebody, you know, or in Snooky, you put a great black to win a frame. Oh, it's a great, that's obviously a great feeling. It could certainly, there's certainly been matches maybe, uh, maybe on, uh, literally on a shot or two, it's kind of turned. So we'd say you're kind of neutral, but maybe you get a great shot and you get a lift from it and you can go on and win the next couple of frames. You've got a boost. Well, also on the same, same, as I said, you lose not so much even a shot, because if you missed a couple of shots, but ended up winning the frame, it's very easy to forget it, forget that, because the sense you won the frame. But if you missed a shot, well, it might be, it's hurt your confidence a little piece, but you, it's easy to forget about it because it says you won the frame and you're still one nil up or two one up. But if you've missed a shot or two, or a particular bad shot, maybe you missed the black, you should have got to win the frame. That's then difficult. That's why I would, and you generally see people would go to the toilet don't probably always actually physically go to the toilet, but it's literally by the it's the minute or two walk to the toilet that has um it's just giving them an extra little bit of time. So if normally you'd be sitting in your chair for a minute, if you go to the toilet, it's giving you those two or three. So the first minute or so or two, you are kind of wound up or whatever. You know, you need to feel like you're going to so you need to feel like you're punching the wall to release yourself mm -hmm. angry. And sometimes if you can even get out of that, maybe get angry and then hopefully by the time you've come back you calm down and then refocus it. Okay, forget about it. As I said, 
and you don't want to lose this frame because you lost the last one. So then you can you go, okay, forget about that. There's nothing you could do and try and be more determined to do the keys you you'd, you'd set out you set out to do. But I mean, you know, I'm making that sound so easy and, you know, there'd be plenty of people seeing matches in my mind say, well, or that now we go, look, we you could list loads of matches where I didn't do it, but it's that is still the blueprint that you don't want to carry to carry on. You literally buy again. I always thought that another example of Nadal, I think, is a great example. He might lose a bad a bad game, a bad set, and actually think he's broken. And if anything, you need to get stronger. It's nearly like he's saying, God, you think you've broken me? Right, I'll go again. And that on the flip side, that's very debilitating to your to your playing. If you're on top of somebody, you know, um, giving them your best stuff. And you just keep coming back. That can be like, what? What have I to do with this guy? You know. Whereas on the flip side, again, you win that 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 good frame to win where he made a mistake, comes out of the next frame, he's still annoyed, he's showing a bit of emotion, he's banging the table. It gives you a great lift. So if you thought before, if you if you thought beforehand you were going to win, when you see that, you really believe it. But also likewise, if you're a little bit uncertain, uncertain, and lacking a bit of confidence, if you see your opponent lose his temperament and composure. It definitely gives you a lift. And a match that maybe could have passed you by, you you end up winning because you actually, what your opponent done has actually affected, affected your um, your mindset in a positive sense. Likewise, if he's playing amazing, you don't want to be thrown in the towel and thinking, oh, how can I win? You just, as best you can, play each each shot in each frame. Each frame is if it's a match of its own individual identity. And then at the end of it, you just kind of add them up and see, did you win or lose? But again, you know, <laughs> so easy to say. So having an ability to maintain your own state or to control your own state is very important in a uh, game snooker as it is in everything else in life, would you say? Huge, but particularly snooker at my level, I basically more or less concentrate for a living. As in, if there's one thing I'd love going out to play, more than, more than being in great form or, you know, even in a great mood, because you can be in a great mood, but not be able to stay in the present, or you could be excited. And again, as I said, if I'm thinking, oh, this is great, I'm going to win this frame, I'm going to win this match, I'm going to win this tournament. While all that's going on, there's every chance I'm missing the shot in hand. Yeah. Whereas that concentration, you know, okay, and again, uh, I was only talking to somebody recently about, concentra about concentration. And like, you know, now when you're in school, oh no, just concentrate. Oh, I'd be, you know, Mrs. O'Brien, it'd be great if you could concentrate. But in school, Nobody teaches you concentration. They don't teach you what concentration is, and they certainly don't teach you what to do to get it or how to get it. Yeah. So in snooker, my my understanding of concentration will be having your awareness on the shot in hand, more or less to the exclusion of everything else. And if that drifts, effectively use your willpower to bring it back to the shot in hand. And there's been days where my mind literally hasn't flickered at all. You know, they talk about being being in the zone. And it's literally my mind's been red, black, red, pink, so on. And it's nearly felt at the end of the match, the referees had to come to his hip Fergal, all the balls are gone. You've won. They go, oh, God, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> such, such was the process. Now, again, I've had another... I could, there's been plenty of days where I put the first red and I'd be going, oh, yeah, that's a good start, yeah. But, be nice to win this this frame. Yeah, get a lead here. Could make a break here. Yeah, this could be my week. Million and one thoughts are. I could be thinking about, you know, should Man United go to a flat back four or, what, you know, are this other tables have distracted me. But ideally, if you have the constant the awareness, the awareness. And I said, on a great day, you're, it feels like your awareness never flickered from. But there's been other days where I've started off good concentration, and you said I've lost concentration, but I've. I've been aware and had, we say, the willpower or skill or skills to bring it back to the shot. So you'd say, okay, forget about that. Back to here. What am I trying to do? You know, so, because otherwise, the way I'm talking then, if you, if you don't have perfect concentration totally in the zone, you effectively can't win. And that's, every professional's had days where you've literally played the game probably as well as it could be played. But that kind of uh, concentration, keeping the shot in hand, and it's a, it doesn't always have to be like a negative. Obviously, you don't have to be thinking, you know, I'm going to miss or I'm going to lose. But again, as I always say, if it's if it's 17 all and you're on the black, to pot the black to win the world championships, the last thing in the world you want to be thinking is this is the black to win the world championships. 
Mm. You want to be thinking, okay, what shot am I going to play? Okay, I'm going to pot the black. How do I do that? And get busy in that process. And then effectively, you know, when the black's in the pocket, then it's over. Or uh, in, in swimming analogy, in swimming analogy, you get in the pool, you swim, 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 swim. And only when you touch, touch the, the wall, would you look up at the scoreboard and see how you did? As opposed to, as you're swimming, sticking the head out, you know, am I ahead, am I behind? What time am I doing? Is this a PB or whatever? So have that mindset just from handshake, handshake at the start of the match to the end that you effectively do your best and keep your mind as best you can on the shot in hand, let alone the frame. Right. Obviously, that gives yourself the best, the best chance. And so what you're saying there is having a, a focus rather than having a focus on the outcome, have the focus on the, uh, the process, the process you practice every day at home. And the process that you practice then you put into place throughout the match would that be right exactly and as it says and, and the top players do that the most consistent and i said um whereas one thing i've always kind of struggled is struggled with is in snooker is if you really really want to win snook at snooker when you're playing do not think about winning at all because the more you think about the winning the results the consequences the result w winning or losing it it takes you uh you're always decreasing your chances of winning so i said the more you can get them totally involved in the process you're increasing your chance of winning but certainly for me that's one thing i've struggled with where, it, where it's a need to be in control or you know effectively wanting to win so much and you if you have a tournament in uh, three weeks time or a year's time and you're preparing for that, and you're putting in all the you're putting in all the practice. You know, you're going to bed early. Uh, you're keeping fit. You have a good diet. You're working with a coach. You're working with a sports psychologist. You're doing all the all the right things because you really want to win, and you're focused on winning for this tournament. And then to flip that switch when you get to the tournament, and don't think about winning at all, and just think about that. That's that can be difficult, not just within a match, but also in a tournament. Because there's been times where maybe I've been in process orientated and it's been going well but then all of a sudden maybe you get to the quarter semis and despite yourself you just start getting a little bit ex uh, excited um getting ahead of yourself so you're nearly thinking about you know sunday and who'll come over you know how will they come over you know will i be able to get tickets for them for the final on sunday and how will they come over and this could be my week and all of a sudden you've just lost a little bit of focus even mm -hmm. when you're practicing or you're not sleeping so good now because you've got ahead of yourself and of course you know, you don't get to play the final. You don't get to play the semi-final because of the quarter-final. You know, what, what it got you the quarter-final, you weren't able to, to maintain. So it's not just within a, a match. It's actually within a tournament to keep that that same calmness uh, and not get, you know, so it, 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 you, you really want to win a tournament. It's, it's your life ambition to win a certain tournament and then to not think about it, you know, and... Uh, you know that, that that's 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 difficult. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's a great point that you're making there. For anybody who does play snooker, even amateur level, so yeah, that, that's great, Fergal. Like you're talking about concentration as well. You know, sometimes when you're watching the game and somebody is far in ahead, a good few frames ahead, and the other person just sitting on on the chair. Um, how, how like in your experience, like if, uh, talking about that, you any of the professionals. How, how have they handled up themselves sitting there for so long, not been not to, after taking a shot for so long? Yeah, that that is very difficult. Particularly, you can have spells twenty minutes, half an hour, where you haven't potted a ball because maybe mm -hmm. either there's been saved, your opponent's played so well, and you've literally played one shot, he's made an eighty break. You sit down again, do another shot, he makes another eighty. So then, when you come to the table, uh, you know that. That, that is, is then difficult. You feel a little bit cold. You also probably lost a little bit of confidence and concentration. That's why even why snoop, one of the great challenges with snoop is also sitting in your in your chair when there's nothing you can do. Because again, generally every other sport, if you throw 180, I can throw 180. If you make a birdie, I can make a bur birdie. And even if you go and try and punch me in boxing, I can still react. I can do something. A great yeah. serve, I can get a racket back to it potentially. But if you're at the table, you know, if if you're at the table potting balls, Mark, even Ronnie O'Sullivan sitting in the chair, there's nothing he can do to stop, to mm. stop you. And it's that acceptance of that that that's out of your control, and to try and keep 
uh, level head and clear thinking. So if he does miss when he come back to the table, it hasn't had an impact. Again, that is one of the challenges through uh, experience of playing. Certainly as you, as you play more, you do get more used to and, and, and accustomed. And for me, anyway, one of, again, if I was playing my ideal perfect match with my ideal mentality, when you're in the chair, you to expect your opponent to miss. But sometimes, maybe depending on where the balls are, you nearly give them the frame, say, okay, they clear up here, okay, next frame. Or, and then if they do miss, you nearly feel like saying to the referee, sorry, you wouldn't just give us a minute or two there because I've totally lost concentration. And, you know, you can't. so sometimes you switched off and then you do get a chance and you miss again because you literally weren't mentally prepared for it. And then if he does end up clearing, clearing the, and he never got a shot, he didn't miss, you've still maintained a level of uh, focus and application as opposed to being in a match, switching on, switching off and very up or down and emotionally. You know, I said, you want to try and keep as calm uh, as possible. And again, in the chair, as I said, like uh, skills might do, might do that concentration mm. point of just counting up to whatever it is. Then also, uh, one thing I learned to people recent years, maybe to do, breathe, you know, breathing. So A, Obviously, that, that t- totally cal- calms you down. So if you're feeling nervous, mm. obviously calms you down. Or maybe if you're also, you know, getting really annoyed, you know, as the old saying, like, t- you know, count to ten or, or take a few deep breaths just to just to calm you down. But also, by if you're concentrated on your breathing, apart from physically calming you down, it's also keeping your mind busy, because the hard part in the in the chair is your your mind, can, particularly under pressure, particularly when it's important. Your mind can easily be thinking like a million things. Mm. You know, and even if it's thinking about winning, I said you're still getting ahead of yourself. And you said you're playing great, you're three and a up. And all of a sudden you start thinking about winning and getting result orientated. And you miss a couple, now your opponent's come back. You know you've lost concentration. You're annoyed because you lost concentration. You know you shouldn't. He's coming back. You're fearful of losing now because you had the lead. He's playing well. His confidence is up. You know, he starts getting a little run of the balls. It, just, it, it can escalate uh, so quickly. So to be able to try and um, regroup, and regroup and maintain that it, it is very difficult. If there's any players past and present, who would you like to play against most? Well, before to play O'Sullivan, O'Sullivan, uh, O'Sullivan. Yeah, he's he's the best to play. He's been he's been the greatest ever. I've managed to play him a good few times. Managed to beat him a couple as well. Um, I would have also liked to play Alex. Hig- I did play Alex Higgins once in like 2007 in the Irish Championships, but like you couldn't even count that as a win. But, like I won five nil, but I mean he was way way past his best, so I wouldn't in any way count that as as a win as such. But um, yeah, him and his pump, you know, in the 80s, uh, you know, that would be a great experience because obviously he was so, but well, the crowd was so involved and so mm-hmm. such a, was such a great player. But I mean the whole crowd and the dynamics and. That have probably been around at some stage during it, but that would have been very, uh, very interesting. But I'd be fortunate that the player, you know, said for the next two years, which player would I most like to play in the next two years? It'd definitely be Ronnie because uh, he's just, uh, and, and you can, can actually get distracted, but he's actually so good to watch that, you know, you can nearly get lulled into like just the Ronnie O'Sullivan show and just, you nearly, you know, you, He's so good to watch. You need to get very comfortable in your chair and you kind of forget, hold on a minute, I'm here for me as well. And <laughs> but you, but at the same token, when actually playing, you sometimes need to subconsciously kind of feel you need to play a little bit better or or a little bit smoother or subconsciously kind of pick up good habits, you know, off him. Or even if he's beaten you and he's played really well, you're always a bit like, yeah, great. It, it kind of really reminds you of the possibilities of how well you can play. And you, you, t- you tend to come back and go, right, practice that little bit more. Like, you know, if he's playing that level, can I get to that level? What do I need to do that level? And then you're always fa- trying to find out, you know, um, is there something he's doing? Is he practicing? When is he practicing? What is he practicing? Um, those kind of things to try. But now he's been uh, superb. And do you ever see him? Um... A player maybe you're playing against and they uh, pull off a great move, you know, a great shot, something like that, and you go, God, I'm going to have to practice that shot. I really want to be able to do that. The, do you still get that? Or I presume you did get that when you were learning and stuff like that. Do you still get that? You still would. No, I, I, hope, I hope I don't get it during the match because if, <laughs> oh, yeah, if, if, if you think, but yeah, of course, yeah, you'd come off. But firstly, after a match, 
win or lose, but certainly if you've lost, you go, yeah, okay, what departments of a game? Okay, I missed a couple of easy pots. My concentration wasn't good. My safety wasn't good, and you go and work on it. But you definitely would also be, if you're, you might have been overly aware of it during the match, but you definitely, after the match, if you're talking to somebody, you'd be like, oh, God, did you see that shot he played? Oh, that was a great shot. You know, that was really clever or, you know, mm-hmm. or, or great skill there. Or And then you might go, sometimes you wouldn't even have to practice maybe because if it's something cl- clever, it's a skill, a shot selection, you're well able to play it. But just it was his thinking at that time. So you probably, you probably be nearly more impressed by, certainly the problem, by how they thought through a situation rather than a, a, maybe a specific shot, a specific shot. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I, I play a bit of hurling myself and I often find during a game, even during training, you see somebody doing something or you try something, you get something wrong or you, you see somebody doing something, you go, yeah, do you know what? I want to be able to do that, you know, and you just go back, go out and practice that skill, you know, that sort of thing. And then when you, once you get it, it's great. It's a great feeling to be able to replicate that skill, you know, to, and as you mentioned there, somebody's thinking, yeah, like that's what makes the difference between a genius and any sport, isn't it? That they can come up with uh, such great imaginative plays that uh, everyone else looked up. I just was not expecting that, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also then to be able to do it under, you know, under under pressure is the big yeah. thing. But again, probably if you even ask them about it, like, oh well, it seemed obvious or or, or simple ever. But yeah, that's one of the great joys I had in playing. As you kind of said, maybe I said if you see somebody. Like you're saying, we're playing hurling. You see, and they do a kind of a skill, and you try and do it. Maybe you're practicing a shot, and say for argument's sake, it's not one of your strengths. So you, you only get a three out of ten. But then that was one one thing I was kind of good at, at practice and practice, and to get a three out of ten, which is weakness, keep practicing. All becomes it might take ten shots, it might take a hundred, but you keep practicing, and that becomes a six, seven, eight out of ten, a strength. That's a great feeling of um, I suppose just satisfaction, or it's just. I suppose satisfaction and just enjoyment that something you weren't good at that you could do and can do well and consistently and to be able to be able to pull, pull that off. And again, this is regardless of your le- your level, whether it's an amateur or professional, is it within your level? If you if you pull off, if you place the maximum of your capabilities or ability, I said it's a great feeling where that's one shot or the match. You know what I mean? And again, you know, uh, I'm sure you can remember great matches you played. Um, you know. Or let me even ask you a question. If when you played, if we were say hurling, if you played your when you played your, you could think about your the five best hurling matches you play. Yeah. Is there two, three things you have done or thought that you could say that you can nearly have a bl- a blueprint for when I play my best, I do A, B, and C. Is would you be able to say that? Uh yeah, yeah, I do. I I know what I do right. I know what I do well. Yeah. And uh, quite often because you're playing with other people when they I find the best thing that can happen to you is you have someone that you're almost psychic with they know where to get into the best position you know to put the ball into that best position actually I was playing a game of soccer there on Thursday and there was times when someone had the ball and they weren't putting the ball through for me and I'm going and because I was used to playing with guys who would know to put that ball through because they know I would run into that position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And to to not worry about the fact there's nobody in that position there right now. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. put the ball through anyway, you know, because they're looking, well, you should run into that position and then I'll put it through to you. But then at that stage, the, the whole play is over. They need to put that yeah. through and know that just have faith that I'm going to run and be in that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When that happens, that's just great, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It must be. But yeah. like in a sense, obviously, because the snooker isn't, and that's the good one. The great thing about that the sense of team sports, if you others rely on, and you can have that that teamwork or relationship or that kind of like gel. Because obviously, snooker, you're, you're on your own. But if you, if, when you've played your best, you there's been apart from those those um, or have you felt maybe that you're reading the past a little bit quicker? Have you felt like you've more maybe more time, or or has there been things? Have you had an attitude going out right? I'm gonna you know mark my man, or is has there been have you, a, have you a blueprint of when you play well? And then also, I would say, the next time you go to play, you try and do, right, I'm going to do A, B, and C, and hang your hat on those, win or lose. Oh, yeah. Well, it's one of the same processes every time 
yeah, whether okay. it's uh, because we practice our processes in training. Yeah. You know? So what you do is you follow those processes. And if there's something, maybe it, it is different practicing something in training and practicing under pressure. So you have somebody breathing down your neck, you know yourself, then yeah. you're more likely to make a mistake. So then it's just, okay, can I calm my mind uh, in the situation, regardless of how close the person is, how uh, fast I'm breathing down my neck. And no matter what the situation is, even if you're on the ground and the ball is there, can you keep your cool and get that ball to uh, get a pass to somebody else, yeah. clear it out of that situation, and then let them have a go at um, at scoring or getting it up to somebody else? Yeah, it's it's amazing that with the sport, when you think if you think it wouldn't be too many more different sports we say than hurling and snooker, as in uh, team of you know team as opposed to just playing on your own. Yours is uh, so fast, so so instinctive, so reactive. I said your, your teammates, it's far more aggressive. There's a physicality, all those things. Snooker has, and I'd say a good 80 90% of your keys to success are the same as mine, you know. And yeah. uh, you know, a, a neighbor of mine, uh, Laura Nolan's her name, she's uh, like a, the dancer, she's on Dancing with the Stars. And I've had chats with her right about and her, her preparation, attention to detail, and also when she's danced her very best, she literally could be talking about me when I've prepared for a tournament and played well. And and and, and Ireland is the same. So that's what I'm saying. There's that kind of uh, a, a generic nearly blueprint for excellence across mm -hmm. the, or the certain nuances in, in certain sports. But I mean, you know, there's so many similarities uh, with it, you know, that you wouldn't think, you know, you listen to you there, Fintan, I'm a bit like, I'm thinking, yeah, I want to you know, just I want to practice tomorrow, and then I'm also th making a commitment the next time I play. Yeah, I'm really gonna nail my 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 keys or my goals. You know what I mean? So you wouldn't think of her, um, you know, and I can barely spell hurling, let alone play it. But yet, just even listening to you, I can totally relate. And, and it's that's a, a, a sentence or two like that. It's effectively motivated me. You know, even though they're not related at all. There you go. As well as you kind of have to know your strengths. You know, when you're playing these games, to know your strengths is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's like when, when you were saying before, um, Fergal, when we represent, like you're part of a team that played against different countries there a couple yeah. of years back, and, yeah. and Ireland won it. All right. Um, yeah, we got beaten the final. Oh, the final. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, that must have been good in a way to kind of bounce ideas off the rest of the lads on on the tour. Yeah, it was obviously played played a few terms. We played in the World Cup final. Um, myself, Ken Doherty and Stephen Murphy we lost to Scotland and then we also played in the Nations Cup myself, Ken and Michael Judge that time yeah, so that was a totally different dynamic it brought a different level of pressure as well because you were very conscious because normally you just play for your own and okay if you lose you lose but you're very conscious actually you know while you were playing because obviously the other two were watching you know um, you're very you're very it wasn't a nice feeling to get lost a frame and going back to him and having to apologise. And I'm sorry about that. And it, it definitely uh, for snooker brought in a new, a new challenge. You know, when it, when you won, it was it was great because obviously now you had somebody, you, you had two other people who were as happy as you were and delighted. And you're looking forward. To, and after you win a match, and go those nights going for a meal or a couple of drinks after, and all excited because you're playing the next day. Yeah, that was brilliant. But it definitely mm -hmm. added a different pressure and that you just felt that. A horrible thing you just felt like you'd let them down whatever about losing about yourself but yeah it was um yeah that, that wasn't it was great but I, I don't know if i enjoyed it so much i you know i i much preferred uh i much prefer playing on my own you know but mm. i did not more even than that actually the last 10 or so years I actually joined uh luke and harrier's running club mm. and i found that very very a new unusual or different because um again I'd normally be on my own and as a general rule even if I was practicing with the likes of Ken we, we wouldn't really discuss each other's games and I wouldn't really be saying to Ken you know you should work on this or vice versa because we're pretty really conscious we could be playing each other next next week and trying to knock lumps out of each other <laughs> whereas in the running club literally that club mentality like it races and people would be giving you tips and advice you know, even though obviously you were going to be racing against, okay, it could be 500 and doing the 5K, you know, so it's not like you were going to be 
battling for first and second. But just that whole concept of people giving you advice and little tips, and you should do this or, or buy a gear here or do these stretches or that training. That took me a while before I kind of nearly opened up myself and that I was like, I give them advice back. Whereas before it's probably a bit like, what's he doing talking? You know, he's, he's you know, he's helping me beat him. But I, I in time, after a little bit, I enjoyed that, that whole, the, the, camar- the camaraderie that, 30, 40 club runners all talking together, all trying to improve. We're all in the same in the same game on the same thing. But there was no level of competition. And if I got beaten by some of we say the good pals of the club, I was genuinely pleased for them. Whereas I've never been genuinely pleased for somebody to beat me in a game of snooker. It was like disaster. You know, so that was that, that's I suppose there's some level of maturity there, but uh, mm. I definitely found that a, a bit different, like that kind of club mentality. Yeah, do you feel like the, uh, the running as well kind of helped your game? I probably asked that before, but you know, yeah, no, d- it definitely, definitely did. Uh, I so I started probably was mid to late thirties, and it definitely helped. As in, you'd probably say that um, if I was normally playing, say, probably six, six hours a day, mm. I was still playing six hours once I became like fit. But I probably found that the last two or three hours were probably maybe as good as the first. Whereas you might have time, you might start at ten. So from 10 till two or three in the day, including lunch, your, your focus is really good, but maybe it's got a little bit tireder that was waning. Mm-hmm. But I felt with that level of fitness, you know, the last hour's practice was generally as good as the first. Um, but also then we're doing a lot of traveling, um, you know, jet lag and all that. Obviously, be a level of, a level of fitness certainly stands here because so again a lot of times you'd be doing this and you'd be wondering is it making any difference at all and then maybe you might go to a tournament and you might have to play three matches in a day in Poland or something and yeah. you have to half 12 at night because you played quite well it's only then you go oh yeah that's where it stood to me I'm not, I actually I wasn't tired playing I still ended up in the tank and you might then have to get up at nine in the morning to play another three or four matches and you stand and I suppose even psychologically it was sometimes nice to maybe look at your opponent if you're feeling a bit tired and you look across, go maybe depending if they were uh, older or, or heavier or whatever. And you said, well, if I'm feeling tired, he has to be worse. Mm-hmm. You know, so straight away, even if, even if it turned out he was equally as fit, it didn't matter at that moment. I believed I was fitter, stronger. I suppose it gave you a bit of confidence. Maybe you might have felt you deserved it a bit more if you're, you're also mm-hmm. fitter and didn't go on that extra mile um, than those. So definitely, it, 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 you know, um, in the bench, and I said, I can't see a time where even when I've stopped playing snooker that I'm not in the running club. And I said, I really, really, apart from even the physical side, actually, as I said, going up to the club, bearing in mind, because if I'm in the club from 10 to 5, I'm on my own, you know, I'm not talking to a soul, don't want to talk to anybody. It's great when I actually go up there and there's that social side for 30 or 40, people yapping and slagging and banter, and you know, just to. I probably, there's days I know, I, you know, I hardly shut up, but that's because I've had a whole day and I haven't talked to anybody, you know what I mean? So, uh, so that's, that, that social side, probably a switch, a switch off from playing from snooker, which, which certainly for me, I've, times have been intense and probably too intense. It's also given me a relaxation apart from uh, any physical fitness benefits. Mm, Do you take any trip experience about that? Any, any what, Brendan? Any new tropics? So anything to enhance the brain performance, such as like lion's mane mushroom. No, no. <laughs> no, no. Should I? No, I'm just asking if you did. No, no. Um, no. Have you ever come across it? No. No, no. Neuro neurofen of a headache. That's about the strength of it. <laughs> and again, obviously, obviously with with, with snooker, those obviously we're very reluctant or very uh, very cautious about taking anything because obviously. Even if you recommend that I'd be gone straight off to make sure I'm allowed to take it, because obviously um, there's certain obviously restrictions as things we can and can't take or yeah. But uh, no, no. But um, and what's the benefits of it? Or does it help? Um, you'd have to look into it. So yeah, things like <laughs> what I mean is supposed to help with um, brain function and all uh-huh. that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, very good. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm open, to, open to any idea that can try and improve. If, if you remember that movie, Limitless, uh, yeah. we'll get your hands on some NZT, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a bucket load of it. <laughs> yeah, although I have to say, I have to say, uh, one of the things I found about NLP was um, 
it really can help your um, brain functioning, if you like, yeah. uh, in a way that I compared it to MDT, you know, that really, uh, when you tap into what all you're capable of uh, in your unconscious mind, it's like absolutely unbelievable. It really is limitless, you know? Yeah. And I had to laugh at what you were saying there earlier, uh, all the things that you were saying, I'm going, yeah, that's an NLP skill, yeah more nlp skills you know <laughs> it's just all of these things like for example changing your state by stepping over the line there was uh all these things uh visualization um all these things uh all a part of the nlp skill set you know and things that have changed our lives uh, as well and and that so that's excellent um do we have time for one more question mark yeah well it's a terrible fergal how, how you do for me yeah I've no school tomorrow. <laughs> I can stay up late. <laughs> uh, no, but John, I wanted to ask you was I know you covered some of it already. Was around your daily practices, your daily practice pro processes, if you like. Yeah. Um, what you do on a daily basis to uh, have yourself ready um, for a match or whatever. Well, well, if we take a match, yeah. Um, well, it depends, obviously, when, you know, we obviously play either morning, uh, you know, morning, afternoon, or um, even though I always prefer actually playing in the morning. I just like the fact that you're up, you know, your breakfast, get changed, and, you know, you play, where sometimes, not the after, maybe so much the afternoon, or certainly, even, it could be a long, a long day, just kind of drags and drags, because, again, you're, if you do practice in the day, the match is probably only a half an hour or so. You're not going to burn yourself out playing for three or four hours when you just play a match. You're trying to keep um I suppose if you if you took it you if you take it playing at ten o'clock, um, you know, you're about to half seven and have the breakfast. But there's been times that happened where I've had done something maybe mind control, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. Obviously, you try and, you know, uh effectively have no no thoughts. And if you're you know, keep keep your mind with no thoughts, and obviously if you get a thought just to kind of maybe calm, not just to help with your mind down. I've done that sometimes just to calm down. Then I said after breakfast and getting ready, you know, again the night before, I do always have my clothes, you know, prepared and ready. And so I'm not like, you know, uh, you're getting ready already as if to iron your shirt or not, you're, you're next a little bit rushed. So I'd always try to be, I, I hate being effectively rushed. Um, you know, I'd always get me say little things. I always make sure you get the taxi and, you know, have the taxi in time, see you there. So you have plenty of time. But when you get there, even if the practice tables are, are busy, you plenty of time to wait the 10 or 15 minutes, have your 10 or 15 minutes, um, little practice, little warm up, which is much as probably getting comfortable and you've, you've got the, the bow tie and shorts or whatever. You ch maybe went into the Toronto office to give them your phone and passport and all that stuff. Maybe you might have to wear a logo or whatever. And I'd certainly then like a good 15 minutes before I've left the room, I might have a, a little list of, I might have prepared of the, where I'd like my mind to be and little, I suppose rough draft or rehearsal of what how the match could go and if this happens and that so you feel like no matter what way the match goes you're kind of prepared for it you're not going to be taken um, by surprise and then certainly the 15 minutes beforehand I'll definitely get on be, if, be on my by on be on my own and if any other player came near me I might just say it opening soon then make, make the excuse so I'd always be on my own and then trying to keep as calm as possible might do some breathing just literally just effectively calm uh, myself down and then generally try and give myself a reminder as, as we're kind of saying of the things I'd like to do in the match the pro what process goals I can do that say the three things I can do today that gives myself the best chance to win and then try and make that commitment to go out and do them you know and then you probably obviously you can a lot of time you feel uh, under pressure or your mind is is given a far greater importance than it is try and calm yourself down and say, look, you know, these are three things I can do. This gives myself the best chance. I can't do any more than this. Enjoy it. And if it doesn't work, if I do these three things and I still don't win, I can't do any more. It's like wishing to be taller. Trust, trust the process as in these are things I know through experience, good and bad, that give myself the best chance. And the more I can commit to them, it gives myself the best chance to get the result I want. What I mean. Again, that's easy saying, is it? Because the, the crazy thing is, when I nail the process, I mean nail it, I always win, and I always generally play my best. And that's what I've played 
O'Sullivan, Hendry, Davis, Higgins, at, more or less at their best. But when I nailed that, you know, I still got the result anyway. But yet so many times, despite knowing this, if for, whatever, for whatever reason you're caught up in the result and uh, the course you end up being, yeah, you, end, you end up losing. You know, so there's that, uh, that challenge and contradiction. But as I said, if, you know, go, if, again, if we go forward, it still applies. I'm on tour for two years, and there's one thing I'd like to do would be that be so very process orientated for those two years. So at the end of two years, I could look back and say, yeah, regardless of how I did, I nailed my process. And whether I did good, bad, or indifferent, I couldn't do any more, more than that. So that. That challenge at 50 is the same as the challenge at, at 19, you know? So it's the same challenge for you. Nick, going, you play playing your next soccer or hurling match. Excellent. When's your next um, tournament for a go? Um, well, October is actually quite busy. I have a couple of tur- a couple of qualifiers for the English Open, Scottish Open, and then in the middle uh, is one of the like good tournaments. Uh, Northern Ireland Open is on up in Belfast. So obviously that's um great tournament because obviously the cl- no there's no tournaments in the Republic, so that's obviously the closest tournament to have. So there's only a couple of hours away. So again, you know, a lot of family and friends go up and watch me for that as well. And I'm actually playing John Higgins in the first round. So that's obviously a uh, very exciting. Looking forward to that challenge as well. So, uh, and then, then on this good few terms. So, I'll try and earn a few quid before Christmas. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. Well, that's great, Fergal. I'll ask you one thing as well. Yeah. Um, you have to excuse my voice is a bit hoarse today. Are you sing it. I was at a wedding the last few days. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I overindulged. It, can you say? <laughs> that's a little. But um, <clears throat> um. I was going to say, you know, the way just say you're, you're gone to a tournament that's far away, like Beijing, or you know, yeah. how different is your routine as you're if you'd be playing in the UK or Ireland? Um, do, do you do you have to change it in a, in some way? Yeah, ab- absolutely, you do. It's quite say off putting the such. Whereas obviously, normally if you're playing on a on a Monday, you know, you probably go over to England, maybe maybe Saturday evening or or um. On the Sunday, again, you arrive, it's only an hour flight. You're probably half an hour, an hour away from the venue. Two half hours practice, bit of dinner, and like you're, stri- you're straight at it. You, you know, there's no impact really on tiredness or anything. Because obviously, if we're playing on Monday in China, you'd have to leave Thursday. You know, and again, if you're flying to Beijing, you probably fly to Dubai, six hour flight, wait for three, another six or seven to. So, that's obviously go Thursday. You arrive Friday, but like you're out of the game. Out of the game. Saturday, Saturday's probably a bit of a write off as well. So then Sunday, you're you know generally on the Saturday we probably wouldn't even practice because there'd literally be no point. You couldn't maintain any concentration with the jet lag. And then obviously Sunday, then you're coming around a little piece. You'd have to try and get a bit of practice then, a couple of hours, um, and then obviously you play on Monday. But the the tiredness and lack of sleep. Is the big issue because there'll be times there, as everybody knows when you're traveling, the first day or two, and you can literally just sit down and you sit down and see if you close your eyes, you're gonzo, you know, mm-hmm. and that can be like in the middle of the day to try and try and get the routine. Or the first night you might sleep great, and the many of the time I went to bed at 10 o'clock at night and I've you know I've slept and I look at the you know the alarm clock on the side, it says 12 o'clock, and we're going, oh My god, I'm not just sleeping for 14 hours. I knew I was tired, can't believe that though. And you go over to the curtains and, start, and it's pitch dark and you realise that was only a two hour sleep. <laughs> it's 12 at night. So the next eight hours you're wide awake. You, you know, so you're watching going back in the day, CNN or you're on the, you know, you're on a computer. But I know, so then you're waiting for six or seven for the restaurant to open to get breakfast. Then at eight, after breakfast at eight o'clock, you go back to bed to maybe 12. And then you kind of have a bit of lunch and say for argument's sake, you're playing to like a half two. So, but again, that's kind of make, managing the most of that situation. But that's if I'm playing at 10 in the morning, that can also happen. So you wake at half 12, one, and you actually know one, one o'clock when you wake up, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sleep and I'm playing at 10, which also, apart from the tiredness, also brings a level of anxiety. So I remember once playing at 10 in the morning, it was like a 15 minute drive to the the venue, like leaving a quarter past nine. Now, like I fell asleep, just gone zone as well. So we're here and arrived. So it's very 
on settling that. Now, the, again, the only thing is it, it's that applying uh, that applies to everybody. Everybody has that kind of challenge. And I suppose maybe mm -hmm. if it was the World Championships and you were playing on that Monday, you'd probably go out the full week before, you know. And again, of course, if you lose on that Monday, fly Tuesday, you're home Wednesday, Thursday, you're probably knackered as well. So mm -hmm. you've had a full week away from home. You've got beaten, so you don't need the money you were guaranteed on. Uh, but you, it's, it, you've only played one match and it's cost you a full week, so you've lost time and practice preparation. And, um, so that is that is the challenge. Like, you can begin every play. And I said, you think it's only you, you go down to breakfast at six in the morning and there's another 12 players there, or you go for a practice at two in the morning thinking, like, you're walking to, to the, because the, usually the practice table is in the hotel. So you're leaving your room with your queue and you think, God, I hope nobody sees me, you're like a lunatic practicing at two in the morning. And you get to the, the practice table and they're all busy, you know. The, the four tables are gone. All the other players are like, yeah, can't sleep. It's just... So again, like that, you, you just try and manage it. Nobody's sleeping. It's not It's not going to be perfect. It, it's not the ideal scenario. So you just, as best you can, make do and try and get as much much sleep and rest as you can and probably be kind kind to yourself as, as best you can. But, yeah, you know, it can, it can be tough, all right. Mm -hmm. Because like what Fenton mentioned earlier on, like <clears throat> with what we learn in MLP can give you kind of structure for all kinds of scenarios, you know. Yeah. Like what, what I found since I've done it, like you know, for writing the list of stuff, important stuff you do during the day, and um, by writing the stuff down, you can kind of get a, a structure on exactly what way you're doing it, like whatever scenario you're in, really, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's the kind of preparation. That's a bit like, you know. Your list. I might have a list for for the match, as in, you know, if 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 you play well, if he yeah. makes a good start, it. What if it's noisy? What if it's quiet? There's, you know, uh, what if the table's not the way you'd like? Those kind of things. So it's just, you don't be, you don't be taken by surprise. And it's the same, you know. But it might be a day. Um, or again, if I'm practicing, I I never go to the club without a list. I never go into the club and just see right. This is what I practice. I know the night before. I have a list. I'm gonna do these five things, those five things can end up being 10 things. But I have those five things I want to do, probably the importance of them. And it's the same, maybe a day off, like, you know, on, on a good day, even if a day off, that you know, yeah, okay, I have to make those phone calls, do that text, I have to book that hotel, I have to book those flights. So if you, if you get up and kind of get that list done and attack the day, you know, that's a great um, a great habit of practice. You know, so it was, you win the morning, you win the, win the day, whereas... You know, if you get a bit lazy, the, day, the whole day's passed and, you know, you only make two phone calls instead of the 10 you wanted or supposed to, you know, so that, that the, the preparation, preparation really for anything is, is, is so crucial. Oh, that's great, Fergo. Thanks a million for coming on our podcast today. No, thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Much, oh, thanks. Thanks very much, Saz. Thank you. Well, yeah, I wish you all the success going forward. Um, in the tournaments in the, in the next year. Next when it wins, when it wins something, I'll come back on. Yeah, looking forward to watching the matches now. Yeah, good. Thank you. You'll be you'll be watching me closely. Going, he's not doing what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best, lads. That's all you can do. Yeah, Why is he hitting them over the head with the stick? <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you, Fred. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Right. Thanks. Bye bye. So that was great talking to Fergal, Fergal O'Brien there, Ireland's number one snooker player. Um, thanks a lot, Fergal, for coming on. It's great, wasn't it, lads? Oh, yeah. it certainly was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, it's great insight into his, to his game and all that. And all yeah, that. and it's good to notice the crossover as well between various sports and, yeah. and various activities like Fergal in the back that last year was a dancer. And getting into the zone, or that's uh, right, it is the same with you know, Finton doing his um, hurling. I was going to say, the as well, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And the amount of uh, NLP skills, if you like, that Fergal uses, um, mm -hmm. both in the game and in his preparation for the game and his practice, mm -hmm. the whole lot, all of these things are uh, really, really come across, uh, you know, yeah. uh, really well, and obviously. Yeah, without even necessarily calling them men of peace skills, um, yeah. skills I suppose that always existed. Uh, but it was great for us to see. Well, it's really uh, just studying human behavior, isn't it? 
Yeah, really. That's and, and the exactly. point I was trying to get across as well was, you know, the way um, he was saying when he goes to Beijing or China or, you know, like when you have a kind of a structure written out or maybe not even written out, but, you know, can probably help in every scenario. You know, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. yeah. We well, can go back to um, when we had Tony on. Yeah. And getting the routines in place for all for the kids and getting everything prepped the night before. Yeah. And like his daily process practices, you know, uh, mm. he has them for when he's in tournament and when he's out of tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. But he, he he always has those practices. He he maintains them every day and he goes through them. And uh, as he said, even no matter what, he goes through the scenarios as well. Things might go right. Things might not go right. Uh, and he hangs his hat on his processes uh, yeah. every time. That's where he bets on rather than on the outcome. Yeah, it'd be great even to get another professional snooker player if anybody's listening and any any is out listening out there, send us a quick email and we can, Aye, we can ask him to get Ken Doherty on. Yeah, get Ken Doherty on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're listening, Cam, just send us the email. What <laughs> <laughs> does he still play up in Jason's in Renla? That's gone now. Is it? Yeah, that's gone, yeah. Yeah, there's, oh, well, there's, there's only there's there. He has one. He owns a club up in uh, Brady's in Turn York. You know Brady's. Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The back, back of Brady's. Um, nice. lovely hall. You can just yeah. bring in your drink and everything when you're when you're playing. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very yeah. nice. Very nice yeah. altogether. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks a million for listening. We're going to do this scale on lay now. I think you're you're doing a fitting, are you? Uh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Great stuff. So uh, today's. Scale and lay story of the day is about an archer, so away from snooker and away from Ireland. And uh, this guy was a top hunter in his area where he lived, and he could shoot anything, whether it was stationary at a distance or whether it was moving, he could get it and he could get it straight every single time. And all the other archers were kind of jealous, but not in a bad way of them. They were going, Oh my god, you're just amazing. Why don't you enter a competition? There's competition coming up. So he went into a local competition anyway. And he was there and it was all his friends and family that were around and he was uh, shooting against. And uh, anyway, he was uh, doing really well and um, a little bit nervous on the day, but he would score top scores and went through anyway to the next level of competition. So he, anyway, he went up into the regional competition and now we felt started feeling a little bit nervous. There was a nice, uh, bigger prize on the on the go now, and a nice, uh, professionally crafted bow and arrows, and the whole lot, uh, and a little trophy, the whole shebang. And he was there, and he started finding himself feeling a little bit nervous. He was shooting against people that he didn't know so well, uh, that he'd heard how brilliant these people were uh, from other people, and. He was there a little bit nervous, but he managed to get through to the finals, the national finals. And now he was there and he had, um, it was a, a, a bag of gold up for the prize, top prize. And he was there and he found himself suddenly as he was, as he was taking the arrows off, something he did every single day of his life. He started feeling his self shaking. His palms were sweating. Everything was, and he, till, uh, for him shooting, and uh, the next day, anyway, he came back after the tournament and he was just practicing with his friends and he was fine. Calm as a day, uh, calm as a, as a, calm as you like. <laughs> anyway. Oh, let that sink in. Lovely. <laughs> like that one. <laughs> Very good. You got your empowering question, Mark. Oh, it's my turn to oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even prepare anything. <laughs> well, I have one if you want. Uh, I don't mind. Yeah, but if you, if you want, or I can put off the bat to you. Or... Right. Yeah, but, yeah, away there, Fintan. Uh, it was just something that came to me while we were chatting to Fergal. And yeah, cool. The question is, what can you put into your daily practice, practice processes to help you get the best out of life? Oh, nice. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's one that I'm thinking about myself now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, for a long time, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great stuff. No, that, that's great, lads. Um, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so once again, thanks a million for listening and watching on YouTube, NLP Upskill Your Life. Today, we're delighted to join by a great guest, a professional snooker player, Fergal O'Brien. It was a great chat, wasn't it, lads? Oh, yeah, brilliant. Great. I have to say, I really enjoyed that. Oh, very informative. It just shows you how all the skills translate across from one skill to another skill. Absolutely. The amount of NLP skills that I use were just unbelievable, you know? Mm. Great stuff. Yeah, so join us again in two weeks' time um, on um, Tuesday week for another podcast. And um, once again, if you have any questions, you can email uh, to um, NLP Upscaler Life at hotmail.com. Yeah, and obviously you can also get us on our Facebook page and on Instagram as well. Great stuff. Excellent. Okay. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks again. And yeah, look forward to the next podcast. Perfect. Good night. Good cheers and good night. Good night. Yeah, so that was a great interview with Fergal O'Brien. Uh, with Fergal O'Brien there. Um, thanks a lot, lads, for for doing another great NLP upskill your life. And once again, thanks Fergal for coming on. What I did forget to do was to show you the card trick. Okay, so what we start by doing is just um, what you can do is just uh, shuffle the cards for a bit. Okay, so then what you start you do then is you spread the deck. To show you on the on the thing here, you spread the deck, and what you do is just mix them around a bit. Okay, mix them around. Then you ask a person of the crowd to pick out the four diamonds. Let's say just a random card, and they they pick out any card. Okay, you go. Mm, close, close. Very good. Very good. So then you just pick another card out and say, um, pick out the King of Hearts. No, oh, King of Hearts. Okay. So they pick another card random from the deck. What? Very close. Very close. <laughs> so then, then you ask them again random to pick out the King of Clubs. So then you pick out any random card. Okay. So then you put the cards to the to the front anyway, you know. So you can bet all them them there and put them aside. And then this is the fun bit. You say to them, Wow, how did you do this? So you start, you got the four of diamonds, you got the king of hearts. And you got the king of clubs. So look what they did. Wow. <laughs> so that's really and um, that's if you if you do that, I'm gonna show you how to do it next. It's it's really, really simple. So the way it works is I've done this before and people really like it. So I just wanted to show you this little trick on the on the podcast. So you just get the cards together. Again, because we're going to be a bit, bit um, messed up. So what you do is you shuffle the card or you let them shuffle the deck. It doesn't really matter. So you shuffle the deck first. Give it a bit of a shuffle. Mix them around. Okay. So when you've done that, you just have a look at the bottom card. Just nice and casually. You don't, you don't even notice you're doing it. So you notice the jack of hearts, yeah? So then you spread the deck. Spread the deck like so. A bit of a spread. So then what you do is you know that the first card is the jack of hearts. So you pull it so you can keep an eye on it, okay? Not so obvious now. Not the obvious you're doing it, but I'm just showing you for practice. So you know this is the jack of hearts, okay? So then what you do is you get them to pick, just say, pick a random card, pick the Jack of Hearts. So they, they pick this card, okay? And you go, whoa, that's close, that's close. So you look at that card and say, next thing you do is say, because you know that next card is a Jack of Diamonds. So then you say, just pick the Jack of Diamonds there. 
So then you say, oh, you're good at this. <laughs> you're really good at this. So then you say, to three of hearts. So you, you, what you do is you know that this, you know, you know where this card is. So what you can do is, after you're familiar with doing this a few times, you can say to them, hover your finger over, and you say, look in someone's eyes and say, tell me when to stop. And then you put your finger in the direction of that card you want them to pick. And when they say stop, go straight down and pick it up. And then, so then what you do, need to do is just put, because you've called out the jack of hearts first, you need to put that in the first place. Then the second card was three of hearts and the third card was the jack of diamonds we look for. So then, as cool as you like, you can really build it up saying, I wonder will you get it, here we go. How did you do this? And then you got the jack of hearts, you got the three of hearts, and you got the jack of diamonds. Good stuff. <laughs> so I'm glad I got to show you that, that little trick. And um, you can just do that a few times and um, you surprise your friends and do a bit of laugh at that. Okay, cheers for the next time. Thanks a lot.